Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Argonaut monthly video covering June 2024. Now, June saw European markets sell off, largely owing to perceived French political risk, whilst American markets continue to rally, led by technology and, in particular, the AI theme. Government bond yields fell marginally, with the benchmark 10-year US Treasury yielding 4.4% at the end of the month. That's down 10 basis points. It was good news on the inflation front in the UK with the CPI inflation figure now back to the 2% target. But in the US, inflation remains elevated between 3.3 and 3.7%, depending on which measure is used. Revised Q1 GDP in the US came in at 1.4%, but we are expecting an acceleration in Q2 with the Atlanta Fed GDP now which has been volatile, but is currently tracking at plus 2.3%. Now, during the month, the European Central Bank cut its main deposit rate to 3.75%. The Swiss National Bank its policy rate to 1.25%, that's its second cut, and the Bank of Canada its overnight lending rate to 4.75%. Even though UK inflation is now back to target, the BOE was on hold at 5.25%, but a quarter point cut is now expected at the next meeting, conveniently post the election in August. The Federal Reserve was also on hold at 5.5%, but even after a strangely hawkish FOMC, the market moved the price in two, previously one and a half, 25 basis point cuts from the Fed beginning in September, previously November. The Argonaut Absolute Return Fund lost just over 1% in June, losing money in its long book, but offsetting this with some gains from its short book. For more details, please refer to our June monthly fact sheet. Now, last month in our video, we looked at some of the anti-supply side measures that the new Labour government will introduce in the UK. We concluded that although the new Labour government claims to be pro-business, what this really means is it wants entrepreneurs and investors to continue to risk their capital, but are less keen on entrepreneurs and investors having the rewards of success through profits. In other words, the Labour government wants to privatise risk, but socialise returns. This month, we are going to recap why the 100% renewable grid which Labour aims to achieve by 2030, is both impossible and threatens to bankrupt Britain. Now, we continue to publish our research on our website, and there's links on the research to our data sources, which anybody uh, can, can, can examine. Now, we would have expected by now, given the gravity of our conclusions, that the wind industry would have tried to engage in a factual debate around our claims. I'm reminded about a visit of the late Queen Elizabeth to the London School of Economics in November 2008, when after being presented with explanations from cocksure academics as to the gravity of the crisis, Her Majesty asked why no economist saw the great financial crisis coming. The answer was, of course, that mainstream opinion is generally lazy, and as Keynes wrote in the general theory, worldly wisdom teaches but it's better for reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. By 2029, we suggest that when the true horrors of the 100% renewable grid are apparent, electricity rationing, sky-high bills, and white elephant wind farms that are still guaranteed a price for the useless output, conventional opinion might begin to ask why no one saw this disaster coming. Instead, to the extent that we've had any pushback, it tends to fall into three forms. Childish name calling, variations of you would say that, wouldn't you? Insinuating that we hold our views only because they support our investment positions rather than we hold very illiquid investment positions, which could be liquidated tomorrow if we changed our minds, but we hold them because we've done our research, which lead us uh, to hold uh, our positions with conviction. Thirdly, trying to move the debate to something must be done, however illogical, because the world faces an existential climate change crisis based on pseudoscientific beliefs, where there's no testing 
of the null hypothesis. Let's recap how a power grid works and how a 100% renewable grid will never work. Well, the power grid is like a factory which always needs to be manned. So in this analogy, nuclear power, which can't be switched off, is the expensive worker who never clocks off. Gas power is the flexible worker who can be relied upon to turn up when needed, whilst wind is the unreliable worker who calls in sick more often than it, they turn up. Now, Labour's proposed energy policy involves sacking all the flexible workers, i.e. gas, replacing them either with more expensive inflexible workers, i.e. nuclear, or those, wind, who guarantee only to turn up when they're not needed. So without the reliable flexible worker that offsets the unreliability of wind power, the factory owner is unable to respond either to the volatility of demand or supply of unreliable workers. So the factory owner ends up either needing to overinvest in the expensive inflexible workers, that's nuclear, or in general employ far more workers overall than needed with no guarantee of being consistently adequately resourced. So the cost of this duplication of resource in building the renewable grid is passed on to British consumers through higher electricity bills. So to mitigate this loss of flexible gas that you can switch on and off, we see it likely that government will continue to pretend that building that, that burning biomass or, or wood in spite of its higher CO2 content than gas uh, qualifies as renewable despite its deforestation consequences. It's also, I think, unrealistic to expect large-scale deployment of nuclear by 2029, even new generation small modular reactors. So Argonaut's research has demonstrated that on windy days, Britain already has a glut of electricity which can't be consumed. It can't be stored since large-scale industrial batteries or the latest fad of green hydrogen remain cripply, crippling uneconomic and it can't be exported since Euro Europe experiences simultaneously windy day gluts. In other words, there is no Saudi Arabia of wind business model. The constraining factor to, re to a renewable grid is capricious weather leading to intermittent power generation. Since when the wind is blowing in the North Sea, it's usually blowing in the Irish Sea, this fundamental problem cannot be overcome by installing more wind turbines. So irrespective of cost, there is already no economic benefit from building more wind power. The companies building these monstrous offshore wind farms nowadays, often the size of Greater London, don't care that their product is largely useless since the government has guaranteed them a price for their output funded by higher electricity bills for UK consumers. So none of these companies would today build a new offshore wind project if it was forced to operate in the free market without subsidies, a guaranteed price, or above average uh, market contract. And this, I think, exposes the oft-repeated myth that wind power is cheap. If it's so, if it's so cheap, why can't companies uh, build wind farms in the free market without subsidies? Now, I say wind is also useless, and it's a generational misallocation of capital. So at higher shares of wind power, with more electricity needing to be stored for longer on nosebleed expensive industrial scale batteries, unable to store power for longer than a few hours, it's very easy to see how building an electricity grid powered solely by renewables would end up costing the UK more than 100% of GDP, rendering it insolvent. So a renewable grid will produce abundant electricity for a few days annually and prohibitively expensive, unreliable power for the rest of the time, requiring a blank check of consumer subsidy, resulting in demand destruction, supply rationing and deindustrialization. Our recent stock market leadership has been narrowly focused on technology and specifically artificial intelligence. It seems to us that when most people talk about the current possibilities of AI, 
they are confusing the advances in processing power, allowing computers to look for correlations in vast quantities of data with the human ability to offer explanations based on causation. The nonetheless impressive technological advances also, together with fear of being left behind, mean that most businesses, including our own, and governments understandably want a dog in the fight, fueling a boom in semiconductor content, not just NVIDIA's GPUs, but also all forms of memory semiconductors, even though the actual pace of true AI innovation may ultimately disappoint. At Argonaut Capital Partners, as our name suggests, we believe that wealth is created despite what government does, and certainly not because of it. We therefore continue to make the case for free markets, which have always led to higher, higher economic growth, better returns on capital and higher living standards for all compared to other forms of government. Investors rightly are paying more attention nowadays to politics, largely because governments are meddling more, which inevitably is a recipe for disaster. Now at the end of June, the first live US presidential debate took place at CNN headquarters in Atlanta between the current leader of the free world, Joe Biden, who's 81, and his predecessor, Donald Trump, who's 78. Now let's look at some of the market moving highlights. And you know, we knock on wood wherever we may have wood that I'm in very good health. I just won two club championships, not even senior, two regular club championships. To do that, you have to be quite smart and you have to be able to hit the ball a long way and I do it he doesn't do it he can't hit a ball 50 yards he challenged me to a golf match he can't hit a ball 50 yards uh, I think I'm in very good shape I feel that I'm as in good a shape as I was 25 30 years ago actually I'm probably a little bit lighter but I'm in as good a shape as I was uh, years ago I feel very good I feel the same but I took I was willing to take a cognitive test and you know what if I didn't do well I aced him Dr. Ronnie Jackson, who's a great guy when he was White House doctor, and then I took another one, a similar one, and both, one of them said they've never seen anybody ace him. Thank you. President Biden? You can see he is six foot five and only 223 pounds, or 235 pounds. Well, you said six four, 200. Well, anyway, that's what you're, anyway. Just take a look at what he says he is and take a look at what he is. Look, I'd be happy to have a driving contest with him. The reason I got my handicap, which when I was vice president, down to a six. And, and by the way, I told you before, I'm happy to play golf if you carry your own bag. Think you can do it? That's the biggest lie that he's a six handicap of all. I was an eight handicap. Yeah. Eight? Never. But I have, you know, I mean, how many? I've seen you swing. I know you swing. Let's not act like children. With Trump's handicap last officially noted at just 2.5. What a shot. This would imply that both candidates can shoot a score regularly below their age, which is a feat achieved by a fraction of 1% of all golfers. Truly amazing. In the event of another disputed election outcome, perhaps a pay-per-view winner-takes-all golf match, including trash-talking, could be an elegant, tie-breaking solution to determine the next president of the United States of America.